I have drawn four major lessons, uh, four major lessons from the, uh, the recent crisis. One is the, uh, the lesson that we can never leave uh, a market to do the self-regulating work on its own. We, we can never leave market to be self-regulating. Uh, we have seen the resource of self-regulating markets uh, at, at our great cost. It has become very ineffectual. Uh, it has not always resulted even in the most efficient allocation of resources. As you can see, uh, the tilt towards the uh, uh, activities in the financial market. The second point, uh, the second point, uh, the second lesson uh, that I have learned uh, from this global economic crisis is that while uh, we see predominant uh, activities in the financial markets, uh, at certain uh, period of time, the size of the, uh, the financial uh, assets uh, on a global basis has been, uh, I would say, more than three times the size of global GDP. So uh, with, that, with that sizable and uh, uh, dominant role of the financial markets, one did not see. Uh, the lesson that I drew was that uh, there, was, there was no real uh, positive impact from uh, the predominant role of the financial markets on the real economy, which is supposed to be. When we talked about financial liberalization uh, and financial deepening, we were, we were actually uh, angling for the uh, uh, financial support for the real sectors, uh, for, for finance to be more efficient, less costly, and, and, and to be supportive of trade and, uh, and uh, economic productive capacity building. But this is not so. There is a detachment between financial market development and economic, uh, real economic development in general. The third lesson that I learned is that uh, while in the past decades, uh, we've been trying to, uh, uh, to adopt the kind of blind faith in the, uh, in the, uh, in the market system uh, uh, to the detriment of the, uh, of the uh, somewhat ignore uh, government and state role. At the time of the crisis, the state was brought back in a big way and the state was playing a, a, a all the states uh, were playing a pivotal role in trying to rebalance the, uh, the, the crisis, uh, re to try to, in to reintroduce stability into the crisis, into the, uh, to solve the crisis, and at the same time to be trying to solve the issues of the lack of social development. So uh, uh, the lesson that I have learned, and this is a lesson that Angtat has been always uh, trying to establish, that while we are saying that market mechanism could be efficient for certain uh, products, not for all products, uh, we should not uh, forget the role of the states in balancing uh, with, the, with the market mechanism, and particularly uh, in trying to uh, help in uh, redistributive policies, uh, to even now the inequalities, uh, to do the social protection, to strengthen participatory politics uh, so that there would be more freedom and freedom would lead to more, to more uh, competitiveness of the economies and, and more economic rational. Number four, the fourth lesson uh, that we have learned is that uh, this is really uh, an interdependent world. It's, it's, it's more interdependent than we would have uh, believed uh, in that with this crisis originating in the uh, subprime mortgages markets in the United States, it has, it has actually spread throughout the whole world. And, uh, and now still pockets of the world that are still going through the process of, uh, of recovering from, from this crisis. And at the same time, why there is this kind of contagion uh, going on, uh, no one is left uh, uh, untainted. Uh, it's to, to find a way back, to find a way back to where we used to be uh, with, our, uh, with our prosperity, uh, we, we have to also make use of the interdependent world by having uh, also the, uh, the global a kind of global governance, uh, uh, interdependent, uh, inclusive governance uh, that can help to bring back stability and, uh, and, and 
establish a sustainable recovery. Uh, coming out of these uh, four uh, lessons uh, are some of the uh, uh, issues and, and, uh, and trends uh, that we have seen that have not always been uh, very helpful uh, in dealing with the, the, the issues of growth uh, uh, and equity and inclusive growth and sustainable growth. One is the, uh, the trend of financialization. Uh, this has been an area in which uh, I thought Angtad was uh, pre preeminent in, uh, in putting our fingers on, on this financialization issue and has actually brought to the attention of the global community. In the beginning, it was not really accepted, but uh, now as... Uh, one can see how much uh, financialization of the commodities market, asset market around the world, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, accumulation of, of imbalances and, and debts. One can see uh, why we had to emphasize the, the issue of financialization. And uh, financialization uh, in itself uh, uh, would have actually uh, uh, not been actually so detrimental without the kind of uh, speculation of uh, financial speculation that has accompanied this financialization process. So financialization has been fed with the financial liberalization policies recommended to us by the Bretton Woods institutions and also by the capital account openness. This has led to the, uh, the major crisis in Asia in 1997, 1998, and uh, uh, here we are seeing again the issues of financialization uh, not really being dealt with in the way that uh, we would like to see in terms of some financial reform. So here is a trend that I raise in this report that financialization or finance-led globalization uh, with all the deepening and, and liberalization actually have not brought the kind of uh, productive capacity build up that we would like to see uh, to generate more employment, but has it only created, has only created some employment in the financial sectors, but a lot of, uh, a lot of distortive uh, 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 impacts on the, on the global economy. The second, uh, the second trend that we keep on working and uh, is now uh, becoming something that uh, uh, I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, it, it, it will be part of the, the, the way we are looking at the new perspective of, uh, uh, of development-led globalization is the, uh, how to avoid uh, the debt-driven growth. That growth has been driven by debt because uh, in all this, in all this uh, crisis that we have seen, they are all mainly driven by excessive uh, debt accumulation, either in the private sector or in the public sectors. It has always been uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, related to the so-called the balance sheet crisis with banks, with households, with governments. So uh, how can we deal with the kind of financial imbalances that are still around in this world? Uh, imbalances uh, contracted uh, in the midst of the crisis in 2008, 2009, but after the recovery, uh, even, so, even though recovery is not yet uh, full flesh, uh, the, the imbalances uh, beginning to expand uh, again. We have seen uh, declining saving rates. Uh, we have seen exchange rate, exchange rate movements, misalignments, movements that are not actually uh, uh, rational uh, based on the, uh, based on the uh, country's competitiveness and, and, and trade, trading positions. Uh, we have seen the average debt to GDP rates uh, for advanced countries coming, going up from an uh, acceptable level of 50% in 1995 uh, to over 300% now. Uh, so uh, this is another issue uh, that uh, will be included in the way we look at the future. And uh, what we are now trying to do is to look at the, th the, the theme of, of uh, sustainable, sustainable debts uh, and responsible lending and borrowing practices uh, that we have discussed since the 1990s when we said that both the borrowing countries 
and the lending countries are equally responsible for the crisis, and not only the, the push uh, to have the adjustment uh, to be committed to only by the deficit countries, by the borrowing countries, has always been a bit uh, uh, partial. It, it's, 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 it's not complete. It's not the correct way to approach. Uh, we always believe that uh, to deal with uh, the debt-driven driven growth issues, uh, we need to deal with both sides of the uh, sustainable debt issues, both lenders and borrowers. The third, the third uh, trend uh, that, uh, of course, uh, we now have to cope with is that we're seeing small economic business cycles, shocks, crises, uh, recurring uh, with frequencies uh, that we have not seen before. There has been uh, more swings, rapid swings in asset prices, property values, exchange rates, uh, that has led to uh, various uh, economic shocks and crises uh, around the world. So these are things we have to deal with uh, in the light with the lessons we have learned, and uh, these are some of the consequences. Uh, I would like to conclude by saying that, I mean, the, the, the report deals with many uh, uh, detailed issues in trade, investment, commodities, and, and other things. But let, let, me, uh, let me conclude by going uh, towards the end of the, uh, of, of the report when I try to come up with some, uh, what we call the, uh, uh, the new development consensus. Here, what, what we are trying to, to state is that, uh, yes, first of all, uh, the pivotal role of uh, de what developmental state must be established. The central role of the state must be established. But of course, here we need, we need more engagement of, of, of uh, policy makers, uh, academics, uh, around the world uh, to establish the real content of uh, and roles of developmental state. Uh, by saying developmental uh, state, we try to send out the signals that we don't want the states to be uh, re-entering the marketplace as, uh, as uh, uh, another operator. We want the states to be helpful to the markets to help in giving markets directions that can be helpful to solve some of the economic and social issues. That the state could be hands and support where market cannot actually mobilize the support. For example, in the, in the, in the uh, new uh, areas of, uh, of sustainable development, in, uh, in renewable energies, in, uh, in green economy, in investment in clean uh, in, 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 in clean e equipments and, and uh, in re the reduction uh, of the, uh, the uh, uh, emissions of carbon dioxide. So here we see the pivotal role of the state, and we call it the development the state, and uh, this is a role that must be well thought out and well defined in a way that uh, we're not going back to the uh, the uh, the bad old days of uh, the states uh, becoming a, a major player. Although what we've seen during the crisis was that the state had to come back in and become uh, uh, a, a pivotal play, player in, in rescuing some of the, uh, some of the uh, financial institutions. But the state must be able to map out uh, balanced growth, growth that uh, uh, must be maintained uh, with a larger and increasing degree of equality. Now what we have seen in the past, and every, every time uh, I have been discussing the issues of inequality, my pronouncement and conclusion uh, every time, and I look back in a few decades of discussion I had on growth and, and inequality, is that uh, if I look at the, at the, uh, the set of uh, policies available at the time that I was discussing, I didn't expect equality uh, uh, to be increased, to be enhanced. In fact, inequalities has been, has been uh, uh, gaining ground. And again, uh, at the moment, if I look at the situation at the moment, how much we are still reliant on, uh, on, on the financial markets, 
uh, I would say that uh, the, the, the developmental role of the state must be very much explicit in the way that we deal with inequality. There must be uh, redistributive policies explicitly adopted by developmental states so that we can, we can actually uh, temper the, uh, the rise in equality. 